I did always, I always forget. How do you pronounce your last name? Rebellia. So I'm here with Christy Rebellia of the Water Market out of, is it Moses Lake or Ellensburg? I'm actually out of Moses Lake. Yeah. Western Water Moses. Market out of Moses Lake. Washington. I don't know why I like Moses Lake, but I always like, I used to live up in West Washington and I'd drive down through the Columbia Gorge, come out right at Moses Lake. And then there'd be all these planes and everything. And yeah, it's just always sort of like was the, it seemed like it was a halfway trip because it seems like getting to Northern Washington takes more time than going almost anywhere in the world. <laughs> well, we feel the same way about Southern, uh, Southern Oregon. So <laughs> yeah, I get ya. Yeah, where are you at, Rich, again? I'm in a little town called Lakeview. Okay. So I'm between Reno and Bend. And you pretty much have to be – Where our claim to fame is 19 miles from here is the farthest spot in the United States from a McDonald's or a Walmart. Wow. Lucky so, you. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people some people disagree, but we, we, we enjoy it. And, oh, there, this is probably one of the more re- – one of the reasons I'm more interested in worrying about the water market is because we get a grand total of seven inches of rain a year. Yeah. So um, water, especially this year, has been on everybody's mind. So so I thought it was timely that this is when I started to see you start to promote the water market. But I'll just uh, I'll stop gabbing and I'll let you. Can you give everybody a little bit of background on you and then uh, sort of uh, say how you got to into water market and how, what it took to get it up and going. Yeah, be happy to. So I, um, I've been working in, in Eastern Washington my entire career and studies, uh, really learning and understanding the natural resource issues here. I became a, a project manager for Washington Water Trust back in 2014. So we were looking to purchase water, lease water, water rights for in-stream flow for fish. And during that time, I found that the market was just really arcane. It was very um, inefficient. It was hard for for buyers and sellers to connect. Uh, In Washington, at least, there's been increased distrust kind of with the market. Um, There was a headline, Wall Street buys up Washington water, millions, spends millions to buy up Washington water. So just a lot of concerns and distrust about this, really a lack of transparency in the market. Um, I see that, you know, market, um, a an actual market uh, can be a really valuable tool to help move water where it's needed most. So that was about a year ago, I started to, to think about how could I help solve that problem. Um, and that's how I came up with, with westernwatermarket.com. It's a basic listing service. Um, I like to think it's it's a bit more than that. It's really a, a quite a large marketing tool and resource for folks who are interested in buying and selling water rights. So you can list water rights for sale and lease. You can list as a buyer. And then we also have a growing network of the top water right professionals in the West now serving over seven states that are available to assist buyers and sellers who come to the market, right? And that's been a a problem. It's it's, folks have not known really how to buy and sell water rights. Um, It's really been reserved for the few who have the, the, um, the knowledge and resources to participate in the market. And that's something that that I want to help bring to everyone. So we launched in February um, of this year and have, have been growing pretty quick. That's awesome. So let's go back a little bit to the path that led you here. So you said you worked for the Washington Water Trust. Is that right? Yes. And then where did you always, so do you have a background in agriculture or conservation or what, what draw, what, what sort of, what path put you on this trajectory you're on now? a good question. So I have a natural resource background. I have a master's in in resource management from Central Washington University. Um, I've worked for the Department of Natural Resources, the Yakima Nation, conservation districts. So really a a heavy conservation background. So tell me a little bit about working with the Yakima tribe, because I I see that they're very progressive in some ways and some ways not. And did that have an emphasis on you seeing this path as far as water and that kind of stuff? Because don't they have a number of, uh, they sort of, they're just sort of at the convergence of several different watersheds, aren't they? 
Oh, they are. Absolutely. They have a huge seeded lands area. And that was, I was the seeded lands uh, coordinator for folks out in the field um, and also their environmental review coordinator. So I would look at any of the uh, the state environmental review documents, NEPA documents, and assess those to determine if there would be impacts to their treaty rights and resources. So got involved in, in some pretty large uh, projects, high profile projects like the coal exports that you may have heard of and remembered from, from years back, uh, wind farm development and impacts related to those. So it was an incredible experience. I feel very honored that I was able to, to work for the, for the nation. Um, and I, I just really believe in, in doing what we can to uphold you know, those, those treaties uh, that ensured the protection of their rights and resources. So yeah, it, it was an incredible experience I'm very grateful for. And what project from your past have you been most proud of? What accomplishment? Oh, that's a good. That's a good, wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think the ones that I've been able to to actually bring to the finish line have been have been the the ones I'm most proud of. So one of them would be leasing water from the Okanagan Irrigation District, even last year during during the drought declaration in Washington, uh, leasing water for from them, compensating them for that water and getting it in stream in a a quick enough time that helps save save fish, right? So using those market based transactions and actually getting it through to a to a lease agreement and and get money exchanged in short order is is something I'm proud of. But it's it's really those relationships, right? That's what I'm most proud of: yeah. relationships yeah. that we've been able to to build, and they take time. Um, in the natural resource world, you know, projects take they take multiple years. So it's really tough to, to get that, that gratification of a big win or big success. So I guess when I think about it, you know, my, what I'm most proud of are the, the relationships that I've been able to help build and the progress that we've, we've made, whether that's at the water trust or, or the Yakima nation or otherwise it's, yeah, it's, it's the collaboration and partnerships. I think that, I, I, I have a little bit of background. I did a, uh, when I learned how to facilitate meetings, I did it with a guy named Bob Chadwick. And we did a um, 21 day workshop over a period of like six months that went from the headwaters of the, what went from the, where the Columbia River goes out. No, we went from the headwaters of the Columbia all the way to the Dalles. Wow. And we stopped in different places along the way. And uh, one of the goals of that meeting was to return uh, salmon to the headwaters of the Okanagan. Mm -hmm. And because they had been, they hadn't been there for years. And so we got them all the way back up into the meth. We, I didn't, I didn't, had nothing to do with it, but the movement that we were a brief part of, were able to reestablish salmon all the way up into the Meha where they hadn't been for 30 or 40 years despite the dams and everything. So when you say that like you were able to do, you were able to get water from Okanagan and broker that, that's no small feat because that water is some of the most controversial water in the United States. And to have enough to facilitate the water that you were able to transfer, plus still keep that salmon habitat going, that's a, that says how much, how far that region of the world has come in managing their water for the positive. So. It's cool that you got to be a part of that. That's got yeah. to be huge. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rich. And really, you know, I was building on the the successes of others, right? They've been working on this, like you say, for a decade or more, developing these these agreements and relationships. And and really, I came in, you know, five years ago and and was able to pick up on their work. It's it's been going on a long time, and I think there's been a really great shift that we're seeing uh, folks coming together, farmers, irrigation districts, the counties, you know, everyone's working, I think, more towards a common goal and seeing the the win-wins, right? It's not so much compromise anymore, I don't think, or the the threat, it's it's really seeing that there's opportunities to create the win-wins, yes. for sure. That's so, that's so this, this conversation's already been more in depth than I'd planned on it to be, so wow. I appreciate that, thank you. Yeah. Um, can you give us a little bit run a little bit more rundown on the mechanics and like how West how you envision I'm sure it's gonna evolve, but how you envision Western water market working right now? Yeah. 
you know, listings coming on the market weekly, as well as professionals coming on to serve. So it's getting populated. You can go right now, take a look at what's available there. We send out about weekly emails with those updates. So as new listings come on, folks can, can subscribe, westernwatermarket.com forward slash subscribe and get those emails when new listings come on the market. So it's really hopefully providing um, great information exchange and transparency in the market. So there are some listings include the price of water, the asking price of water, which is really helpful. Um, and, and we haven't had a lot of information publicly available about that before. So I think that's some added value. Uh, but really, it's, it's a very simple platform. And that's that's the goal, right, is to make it easy to navigate, uh, to find what you need and, and not have all the fluff that you can get lost and frustrated with. So I hope that it's it's a nice, clean, clear platform for folks to use. It is, it's $49 a month to list. I think we're getting ready to, to increase the monthly listing fee. So it's a, it's a monthly listing fee and you can cancel at any time. We don't take a commission or, um, or transaction fees. So the idea is I'm not a broker, right? I'm not a broker and I'm, I'm happy to actually not be involved in the transactions at this point. I am what I call like a neutral market operator. I'm just ensuring that the platform functions and works for everyone. So right now we're mainly in the Northwest, but I see that you know we are growing and, and it's a service that's available really for, for anyone in, in the West. It has very, it's a broad based platform that doesn't have a lot of rules built in. Uh, so hopefully it's, it's that much more accessible and usable, whether you're in, in Texas or Washington. It's it's really a platform for everyone. And I have to say, it's so seldom that people, and I think it's so seldom that people actually just create a peer market spot where the where you create an exchange where people just um, buy and trade, and you just make those relationships. Yeah. Usually, some people will do a relation. They'll build a platform, but then they'll want to have a piece of either relationship and or somehow how somehow guide that along instead of just providing the platform and seeing what happens. So I have to commend you on that. That's amazing. So the question that struck me is how many people, when you tell them what you do say, I had no idea you could sell water. <laughs> yeah. quite a few. I think my family's still confused, right? <laughs> These articles come out and they're like, okay, I understand a bit more about what, what you're doing. Uh, but yeah, people, people, I think in general, the public, don't have a very good understanding about water rights in the market um, and the need for the market. So yeah, it's okay. Bring them on, Rich. Bring them. Bring them on. Sorry, I got a three-year-old that has problems. He, he cannot not be in the podcast. Yeah, bring him in. I have a three-year-old too. She would jump in, in a heartbeat if she could. Say hi. Wow. What happened? Hi. Your diaper has problems, huh? <laughs> Here, let's take your pants off. Go take your shoes off and take your pants off, okay? Okay. All right. Wow. So <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> we, we're headed to Boise. His mom's working. And we're after this, we're going to jump in and go do a grass-fed beef meeting in Boise. So Awesome. Lucky he, kid. He's hanging out with Dad for a while. Um, awesome. I have another question. Oh. Water law is incredibly challenging. Each state holds a has a little bit different interpretation of how they do their water law. Like Nevada is much different than Oregon, and it sounds like Oregon's different than Washington. So, what are um, some of the what are the, some of the challenges that you faced getting going as far as sort of making this a platform that's universal? Yeah, given well, the complexity of water law. Right, it's a great question. Uh, Rich, and that's exactly why I've really turned to the local water right professionals and why I have reached out to them to to become part of the market. Right? There is no way that Western Water Market, ourselves, myself, can be a water law expert, water right expert in every state. There's just no way. And so part of, I mean, a huge part of Western Water Market are the water right professionals who have come to the market to support it. Right. 
I'm relying on them. The buyers and sellers coming to the market need them. Um, and so they're, they're a huge critical part. It's just absolutely critical that you're working with a local professional when you're looking to, to buy, sell, protect water rights. You want someone, like you're saying, who knows those, those state laws and even local regulations and policies inside and out, for sure. Um, oh, I just had it. Oh, I'm going to get to the part where we wrap up, but I asked you some nice wrap up questions. But I have one thing that's just uh, been, for the last couple of weeks, been on my mind. So recently, water has been commodified. Yeah. So how big is that? Was that something that you were prepared for? And how do you see that balance between that type of market and the realities of the water needed for agriculture and conservation? And how is that all going to balance? Yeah, great question. So I think you're referring in part to the, the California Velas Water Index. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, Rich, I don't understand how it works. I don't understand. So NASDAQ is involved. It's it's going to be traded you know, publicly. I have no clue the mechanics of how this works. And so I think it would be really helpful because it's it's a bit it's a bit concerning to me, but I know that there have got to be some some positives here too, right? I'm, I'm just hoping and thinking. So I think it would be a value uh, for Westwater Research and CME Group, others that are involved to really do some, some more workshops, uh, or something, webinars to help the public understand or even the professionals understand how this actually works and what those implications are. Uh, perhaps someone who's familiar with the stock market could, could understand it more clearly than I, but I, I just, I, I can't, sorry. <laughs> Were you, were, you, were you sort of surprised what happened? Um, you know, I, yeah, yeah, I was. But I think that the, the California Velas water index was, was the first step that likely should have been an indicator. I'm really curious to see if and where that can be used in other places, right? Is that something really unique to the California market? Are there plans to expand it? Um, I just, I don't understand or know enough. I just I, th I find it fascinating since like I think two thirds of most of the food in the United States is grown in California. It's it's if you do commodity wise across the world, California is the fifth largest uh, country producing agriculture. Would be if it stood alone. Uh, so having that in the mix um, really seems like it's uh, going to add a whole new wrinkle to California politics. Yeah. So, I would, I would say so. So the question, when you started Western uh, Water Market, what was your worst fear? Oh. What was, the that, what was the thing that almost stopped you from starting? Because you probably had moments of doubts before you just took the leap. So what was the fear that you had to overcome before you did that? The fear really um, – the fear was was um, criticism from my colleagues, not getting the support from from the colleagues, from my colleagues, from the state, from other stakeholders, players, um, and that's actually why I didn't go to them first. I built it. I didn't tell anyone I built it. I built it and I launched it because I knew if I started having those conversations, it may never come to fruition. Right. I may feel the pressure to not move forward. And I knew this was too big, too important to let it get sidetracked by those, those fears. So I pushed forward and that has been a, a fear, was a fear of mine. But I'll tell you what, what I was able to quickly work through that when the professionals in the industry, the consultants and the attorneys stepped up and said, we absolutely see the value in what you're doing, Christina. Western water market is needed and, and we're here to support you. And as soon as I, I realized that, that they were with me, that they saw the value, that I could really take this forward, that Western water market was of value and that it, it uh, could, be, could be supported. And I'll say it is their financial support through their monthly listing fees that have gotten us through to today. So I'm, I'm grateful for the professionals who are, are behind the market. Yeah. Yeah. I think you have to, 
you're gonna have to weave some real estate in there and you really take off. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's work on that, Rich. I'd love to add a listener to two of yours. Yeah. Um, what would you want people to know? I'm still on this from Jackson Muller's podcast, but uh, what would you want people to know about water that they probably don't know? Hmm. I think it's probably the to understand the complexities of water rights and that these are our private water rights that have been upheld by by people, right? So water is is a public good, but folks have an actual legal right to that water that needs to really be to be respected. Um, and that that we should be working within the the legal confines, the market to to help move it around. But that those those are real private property rights in my eyes. Yes. I, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. Right? It's like the difference between uh, water and the navigable waters. Like there's a lot of places you can be on property, private property as long as you're in navigable water, which is basically anything, my understanding, anything you can float a canoe down. So, um, and people get upset about that all the time and they don't understand that there's, it's very, like I said, it's very complex. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to take time to say that I really appreciate the way your fears. And I think you're a wise woman for just uh, by the bullet and owning your, just keeping that and you're making it your vision and then sort of letting it out to the wild. So, and I uh, have to commend you for doing this. I think that when I saw it, I thought, is this what I think it is? And then when I researched it more, I was like, it is exactly what I think it is. And it's, it was so needed. So oh, thank uh, you. Thank you and, so much. Uh, so what is, um, what's the best possible outcome that you see in the next few years that's going to come out of the Western water market? Uh, that we can move water more quickly and easily to where it's needed most. So especially in, in drought years, um, getting that, that water, whether it's to, to farms, for fish, whatever it may be, is just creating a market that is more liquid and and things can happen quicker, especially in those those years that are are so severe. All right, I gotta get my soapbox just a little bit more. Please. Think, um, when we talk about like the because carbon sequestration and carbon markets are a huge deal right now, and so like there's one like yours that's set up sort of like yours where they're just the broker and that's Nori. Um, but as I've gone down the carbon markets and began to learn and understand how they function, um, mm -hmm. what I'm learning learning is really the basis of sequestering any carbon whatsoever comes from water. You can only create carbon and sequester carbon if you have reliable supplies of water. And in order to do it on a higher scale, that's going to put a tax on the water. So our need to efficiently manage water in this thing to sequester in this, in this, future where we envision using more agriculture to sequester more carbon yeah. it's going to be incredibly important so why well, the name of the game right now is carbon sequestration i just think it's a matter of time before people realize that how critical a role of water is in making that happen yeah. and how i think and you can correct me if i'm wrong but there's a lot of water rights that aren't being utilized to their highest potential yeah. and maybe people were holding on to it for fear of losing it but if there was so maybe when people can start seeing value and transferring it to other places i think that i think it's this exponential value that you create out of resources that were not used what what, what would you say to that yeah thanks rich i i couldn't agree more i mean that's that's just it right it's it's critical and every state is different like you say right but people need to use their water rights or put them in a place that protects them in washington we have the trust water rights program um if you can't use them wholly or or uh in i mean absolutely do not lose your water rights right sell them lease them something before you get to the point of losing them forever you have to absolutely use them or put them to beneficial use right so whether that's uh, through a state program, through through use as defined on your water right, you've got to do that. If you can't, work with a professional to explore your options. And that may be leasing them on the market or selling them if you're no longer going to use them. 
keep that value and also keep that water right in play because the water rights that are relinquished are taken out of play, right? They still add value. That water still adds value, but but they're no longer able to be to be bought, sold, transferred. So a few things to consider. Work with a professional to explore your options and to understand what you have and could lose. Yeah. I know in Oregon, I don't know how, you have to correct me on the proper phrasing, but per, uh, per acre water, right? Or how's that, what's the phrasing for that? Acre foot, per acre foot. Per acre foot. So for so many X that used to trade at about $1,400 if people were moving a corner of a pivot to somewhere, yeah. that has now where I live gone up to $6,000 in under three years, from fourteen dollars to $6,000. Wow. So it's people, I think that people, uh, this is sort of a sleeping giant in the West and people would be very well to follow your, get your newsletter and see what's happening and just keep an eye on it because uh, I think it's going to be critical in the next five years, probably to the decade. That being said, final question, and then I'll let you uh, say whatever you'd like. So you're looking back, uh, your three-year-olds just graduated from college. You're looking back over what you uh, have accomplished. What do you want to see? What do you want her to be proud of? Wow. So I, I want her, <laughs> I want all the sacrifices we we're making right now as a family uh, to, to be worth it. And I want her to, to live in a world that has a, a really liquid market that's able to move that water to where it's needed most. And that people are fairly justly compensated for those assets that they've managed. Um, I I want her to I want her to to see me as you know a strong a strong uh, woman, but first and foremost a great mom. She is always uh, every decision I've made in my career, including developing Western Water Market, has had her in my in my mind and 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 heart at the forefront. So I won't do any of this uh, really without, without her. So I just hope I, I make her proud. <laughs> I hope I give her the childhood that uh, that I, I want her I want her to have and the mom, so. Right on. Um, What else? Yeah, we're sort of at the end. Do you, do you, yeah. Anything that we didn't cover that you wanna say or you gotta plug uh, your Western Watermark again, tell people where to get it. I'll put it in the show notes, but. Thank you, Rich. Westernwatermarket.com. You can connect with me also on LinkedIn. Um, that's that's about it. Subscribe, westernwatermarket.com slash subscribe, and you can start getting those, those emails, those newsletters. So uh, this has been great, Rich. Thank you. Thanks so right. much. Look forward to talking again. Likewise. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. And it's ended.